Acts chapter 8, we'll begin reading verse 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose, and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. And eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both, uh, uh, and they both, and they went down both of the both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Let's pray, Father. We bless you. We certainly do thank you for the good singing. We thank you, Lord, for the goodness of God. We're without excuse not to worship and praise you for who you are. You're the God of glory. You're the Lord of lords and King of kings. Besides you, there is none else. And Father, we've come tonight to pay homage to you and to lift you up. For you said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And God, I pray that, Lord, uh, you would be truly exalted from our lips, but also our lives, that others may see the goodness of Christ, uh, uh, the love of Christ, the glory that is in Christ, and they may too come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now, Father, I pray for those that are working with the children over on the other side. God, you'd bless their efforts. Uh, Lord, they give up their Sunday evening service to work with the children, and I pray that, Lord... Uh, uh, those children would find the word of God precious to their heart. May they hide it in their heart that they might not sin against thee. Father, we certainly do thank you for that ministry and God, the fruit we've seen from it. Father, I do pray that, Lord, you'd help us tonight from the word of God. May we ever draw closer to Christ. May our hearts ever be overwhelmed at his goodness. Uh, Father, we certainly pray that, Lord, if somebody's here tonight is hurting, that, God, you'd help them. If somebody is seeking, they would find, uh, Father, if there's somebody here lost in their sins that don't know about Christ, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Father, I pray if there's somebody in the valley, they'd find you the lily of their valley. Uh, Father, those on the mountaintop, Lord, they'd shout from the hilltops uh, the greatness of Christ. Uh, now have your will and way. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you and praise you for what you do. Uh, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things from this passage. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is the servant. Look again in verse 26. We find the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is a desert. Now can I say at this time there's revival going on at Jerusalem. Can I say God's people uh, are being blessed, uh, uh, they're being greatly helped, uh, God is doing wonderful, miraculous things in their midst, uh, and all of a sudden, out of the midst of that, uh, 
uh, the Spirit of God speaks to Philip and says, Philip, I want you to head to the desert. Uh, 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 I said I want you to notice the servant because he is a true servant. Uh, he didn't balk at it. Uh, he didn't say, no, I'd rather hang out here where everything's good. Uh, you know God had to be in it because nobody's going to leave a place of revival for a desert place. Uh, yet being a servant, Brother Bob, he's obedient uh, and he just does what God says. Uh, can I say a lot of times serving God, it doesn't make sense. A lot of times God will ask and require of you things that you would have never dreamed of, things that you didn't uh, 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 want to do, things that you didn't uh, uh, particularly like to do. But if you're obedient to do what God says, God will use you in a great mighty way, which he does fill up. We see the servant. I want you to notice the seeker. Look at verse 27. And he rose and he went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to worship uh, to Jerusalem for to worship, and was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Here we find a man of great authority, a man that has been given charge over all the treasure of Ethiopia. This is not just a fly-by-night guy. This is just not a quirky guy. This is just not somebody who is not stable in who he is. Uh, you know, the world wants to uh, portray folks like you and I that worship Jesus Christ, that we're weak-minded, that uh, 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 we need to depend on a God that's out there that doesn't exist, and that our lives are miserable uh, without uh, uh, this ray of hope that we've built up in our own minds. But here is a man of great stature. And yet, there's something missing in his life. He's went to Jerusalem to worship, and Brother John, he's went there and went through some things, but there's still an emptiness in his life. Let me give you some things about this seeker. Can I say, first of all, he's a dedicated servant. You don't get charge over the queen's treasure unless you're dedicated. His very life, is on the line every day if one piece of that treasure is missing. He's a dedicated servant. Can I say he's been deceived by sacrilege? He's up there worshiping, but he doesn't know what he's worshiping. Can I say he's an Ethiopian? Why is he in Jerusalem worshiping Jehovah God? The Jews are still God's chosen people. Why is he there at the feast worshiping a God he doesn't know? He's not only a dedicated service, he's deceived by sacrilege. He knows something's missing in his life, and he heads down there because he's heard all the stories about how great God is. Can I say something else? He's dead in his sins. Mm. He doesn't know it yet, but he's dead in his sins. Can I say, you and I, before we came to know Christ, we were dead in sins, but thanks unto God... Who, we, when he redeemed us, raised us to newness of life. Uh, he quickened us by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, can I say something else about this seeker? His desire is for satisfaction. There's something missing in his life. It amazes me how people try to fill a void in their life that only God can fill. Some try to fill it with a bottle. Some try to fill it with a needle. Some try to fill it with a uh, uh, sport. Some try to fill it with uh, 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 all kinds of other things that will entertain them, that will uh, occupy their minds, that will uh, uh, cause them to find some kind of satisfaction in this life, but only true satisfaction is found in Christ. When God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, the very conscience of man knows there's a God. That's why no matter where you go in this, in this world of ours, in the deepest, darkest jungle of uh, the farthest region away, you'll find somebody there worshiping something because there's a void in our life that was meant for Jesus Christ and we're to worship Him and glorify Him. We see a servant. We see a seeker. Notice the Scriptures. Look at verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led of the sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before a shear, so opened he not his mouth. He's reading Isaiah 53. 
And can I say, the Scriptures is about ready to change this fellow's life. Can I say, Peter said we've been begotten by an incorruptible Word, the precious Word of God. Can I say, it's the washing of the Word of God that brings salvation to a sinner. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Apart from the Word of God, there is no salvation. God left us His Word to show us what it takes to be saved. Uh, uh, we find that the law was given to be our schoolmaster uh, to teach us uh, what is sin. Uh, and my dear friends, when we come to the conclusion of what sin is, we come to the conclusion that we were uh, conceived and brought forth in sin and we're sinners by birth, uh, sinners by practice, uh, sinners by nature. Uh, uh, we're sinners because we like to sin. Uh, but Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth uh, to break the bondage of sin uh, and to usher in salvation to all them that would believe. Uh, we know that through the Scriptures. Uh, we know through the Scriptures that it was God that framed the worlds. We know through the Scriptures uh, that Almighty God sits on the, uh, on the throne in the sides of the north. Uh, and thanks be unto God... Uh, He's my God because somebody preached the Scriptures to me. Thank God for the precious Scriptures, the truth of the Word of God. It amazes me that we live in the information age. And can I say one of my pet peeves is people who are ignorant in this day and age. There's no excuse to be an ignorant. I'm not talking about people that have learning disabilities. I'm talking about people who choose not to learn. We have every resource available in this day and age to where you can learn. But it amazes me how that very verse we read is how most people are, their sheep being led to the slaughter. They'll take somebody's word for it rather than seek truth. Mm -mm. We live in a day and age where people are being misguided, misled, and they don't even care. Mm -mm. Can I say a hundred years ago, people would have loved to have the access to the truth that we have today. Hmm? The access to knowledge and learning. Shoot, I remember when I was a boy, everybody, every parent would do everything they could uh, uh, to buy that very expensive uh, 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 encyclopedia set that they'd come door to door trying to sell, uh, and it was the greatest dust collector that we ever had. I only got mine out every time I had to write a paper, you know what I'm saying? I remember when I started preaching, I'd have to go to the library, Brother Ron, and research things. Went one time, I, uh, some of you have heard that message I preached on the lily. Well, I went to the library, and I'm checking out flower books. They look at you real funny if you're at the library and you're checking out flower books and you look like me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but uh, people don't go to the library anymore. Matter of fact, if you pull out of your purse or out of your pocket that little thing called a telephone, cell phone, you have more information available to you through that phone than generations of people had before us. You can call your, my friend Google and you can find out just about anything you want to find out. Uh, and yet, people still don't desire the truth. Can I say the absolute and final authority, the greatest truth that has ever been given is the precious Word of God? Uh, this is absolute truth. You know, uh, uh, naysayers will say that, uh, oh, well, man wrote the Bible. No, men were just the instrument God used to pen it down. Uh, in my pocket is an ink pen. This pen has no congruent thought of itself, but it'll pen down everything I want it to say. And I say that's what God did. He used holy men of old to pen down His Word. Uh, you know how I know man didn't write this? Because this tells us how wicked man is. If man wrote it, it would tell us how great man is and how we have no need of God. Mm. We find the Scriptures. None of that was in my notes, but it didn't cost you anything extra, all right? I want you to notice something else in this text. I want you to notice salvation. Look at verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, Thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This seeker, once he was introduced to the Scriptures, and somebody come and expounded the Scriptures and explained to him what he was reading, he put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got saved that day on the way 
to Gaza, the desert. Hmm? And then I want you to notice lastly, as a way of introduction, the submission. Look at verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized, or and he baptized him. So we find he submitted to baptism. Now look at verse number 36, and we'll get to the thought. I don't have much to, to really preach on tonight. I've just got a little thought that I want to give you. But verse 36 says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He's saying, How come I can't be baptized? With God's, hope, uh, God's help, I just want to preach on this little thought. I want to preach on what is scriptural baptism. We've got a baptismal service tonight. I don't often preach on baptism, and when we do have a baptismal service, a lot of times I'll make a few comments before we actually have this, the service. But the Lord's put it on my heart tonight to just expound for just a few minutes on what is scriptural baptism. That's what the eunuchs ask it. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And can I say there's a lot of confusion about what baptism is. And so we want to look at what the Bible says about baptism. I'm interested in what God says about baptism, not what some fellow says about baptism. So what is scriptural baptism? Can I say, first of all, I want you to notice the prerequisite to baptism. He says, what doth hinder me? from being baptized. In verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Can I say the prerequisite for baptism is you must be saved by the grace of God. You have to experience salvation. Listen to me. There are a lot of folks that believe that baptism is salvation. No, it's not. If that was the case, he'd say, let's just stop the chariot and get baptized. But there was something hindering him from being baptized. He wasn't saved. Uh, and you have to be saved in order to be baptized. Uh, preacher, how does somebody get saved? I'm glad you asked. Uh, John chapter 3, verse number 3, the one of the most religious men in the Bible comes to Jesus by night. Uh, and he asked, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, and this is what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, listen, in order to be saved, you've got to be born again. Uh, hey, you are born naturally in this world, physically, uh, but you need to experience a spiritual birth. Uh, you need to be born again a second time. Uh, one man said it this way, uh, If you're born once, you'll die twice. You'll die a physical death, uh, then you'll die a spiritual death for all of eternity uh, uh, paying for your sins because you wouldn't let Jesus pay for your sins uh, but if you're born twice you only die once what a blessing huh you have eternal life in Christ uh, the Bible says in Romans 3 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God we all have one thing in common we were born sinners hmm? and if you're honest your flesh likes to sin even after you get saved we were all condemned because of sin. It's very important to understand. Because if you don't understand you're a sinner, you can never be saved. Hmm? The Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin was passed upon all of us. That's why what we just celebrated here a couple of weeks ago, that Jesus came into the world and we celebrated the birth of Christ. Uh, the important thing of the whole story is he's born of a virgin. He didn't have the same earthly father that you and I had. He did not have tainted sinful blood. Uh, he came from glory to pay our sin debt. What a blessing. Uh, Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, can I say... For a good man, some would even dare to die. But we were old rotten sinners. And Christ chose to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Romans chapter 10, verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what that eunuch did right there. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 8, uh, 10, 10, uh, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, a lot of people have a head knowledge that Christ is the Son of God, but you've got to believe in your heart. And the only way you can believe it in the heart is if the Holy Spirit deals with you about your sin and you open your heart to Him, and you can believe in your heart. Romans 10, 13, Brother James verse wrote a song on it, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Huh? I'm glad there's no respecter of persons with God. In this world, people are prejudiced. People have favorites. In this world, people look at skin color. People look at what uh, your address is, how much money you got in the bank. And all. Can I say the ground is leveled for the cross? God doesn't see who you are. He sees what you need. And what you need is Him. And I'm thankful that He's no respecter of persons. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, you couldn't save yourself. If you could earn your way into heaven, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross for you. But you couldn't earn your way into heaven. It's not of your works or my works, not how much money you give, not how much you go to church, not how much you pray. Not, it's none of those things. Salvation is by grace. That is the unmerited favor of God. You didn't deserve it. And it's by faith. When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary, that he was buried and that he rose again according to the Scriptures, and you believe he is the Son of God, and he'll save you. You'll call on him. He will save you, friend. The prerequisite to baptism is you must be saved. You must be born again and praise the Lord for salvation. Hmm? I'm not much, but I'm born again. That's all that matters. And a hundred years from now, that's the only thing going to matter in your life, what you did with Jesus Christ. And I'm glad I know him as my Lord and Savior. We see that there is a prerequisite to baptism, but there's also a process of baptism. Look again at verse 38. The Bible says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both, what's that word? Into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. There's a process of baptism. Baptism is not being sprinkled on your head with a little water. If we had time, we'd go over to John and show you when Jesus was baptized, the same terminology, they went into the water and they come up out of the water. Baptism is by immersion. Mm. The proper process is to immerse completely into water. Why? The water represents a liquid grave. And just as you were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, you were buried in death with Christ, and you raise again to newness of life. That's what it shows. Uh, it's a symbol. It's symbolic. There is a process for it. It's very important. By the way, uh, the Catholic Church and those that branched off the Catholic Church, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, all those that sprinkle, up until the 16th century, they all immersed as well. They all immersed into water, and one of the popes in the 16th uh, century decided, well, let's just do it an easier way with a sprinkle. Hmm? And my dear friends, it's not about sprinkling, it's about being immersed just as Jesus went to the grave and he came out of the grave. That's what you're showing, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a process. I don't mean to be unkind. It's just my nature. Can I say that? Hmm? I saw a picture the other day that represented John baptizing the Lord Jesus. Now listen, the Lord Jesus didn't get baptized because he was a sinner. The Lord Jesus 
was born under the law and he had to fulfill the law and John the Baptist was the last prophet from the Lord under the law. And, and John preached uh, remission of sins through baptism. And in order for Jesus to fulfill the law and fulfill the requirements for you and I to be saved, he had to do everything under the law. He was not baptized because he was sent a sinner. He was baptized really into his humanity and into his ministry. That's what he was doing. He was just fulfilling the, the law. He wasn't baptized as a sinner. But I saw a picture the other day, and it represented John baptizing Jesus. And Jesus had a halo, and John was sprinkling some water on it. But first of all, Jesus didn't walk around with a halo. If Jesus would have had a halo, they'd all listen to everything he said. They'd have believed everything that he, they would have known he was the Son of God. But the Bible says he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, hallelujah, put my name there, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. Uh, he didn't come to set up a kingdom. He come to die. And die for your sins and my sins. There's the process of baptism. There's a prerequisite for baptism. What is the purpose of a baptism? Why do we have to be baptized? Well, friend, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. We know that because while Jesus was dying on the cross, one of the thieves uh, looked at him and said, Lord, when thou comest in thy kingdom, remembers me when thou comest in my ki thy kingdom. Uh, and Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that thief on the cross died, but he went to heaven. He wasn't baptized. So we realize that baptism is not what saves us. Well, what is the purpose for baptism? Baptism is the very first step in obedience in a Christian's life. Once you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first step of obedience is being baptized. And when you're baptized, you're baptized into His, his church. And you're identifying with Him and His church. It's very important to understand that uh, uh, folks that uh, submit to scriptural baptism, they're giving a testimony to the world that I believe in the Lord and I'm lining up with His church and His teachings. And can I say... The fellow gave us this towel right here. My friend, Brother Luther Spivey. Brother Luther has started nearly 100 churches in Mexico. Uh, Mexico City and South, where a lot of uh, uh, the rebels and guerrilla warfare is going on. that never makes the press. Um, Brother Luther's uh, done a great work down there, and, and uh, many folks have come to trust in Christ. But you see down in those little towns and villages where they are, Every one of them has a priest down there. And if you get born again, that upsets them. But if you get baptized into a local church down there, outside the Catholic faith, they will ostracize you. As a matter of fact, most of those villages, the priest runs the village, runs the grocery stores and everything else down there. And my dear friends, if you identify with that rebel Baptist crowd, you, my dear friends, aren't allowed to buy groceries there. You're not allowed to do business in the town square. And you say, what happens? They really believe on the Lord when they get baptized. And most of them want to get baptized the very night they get saved. And Brother Luther said they'll have services that will last three or four hours, and folks getting saved, and then they'll stay another four or five hours and folks getting baptized. And what a blessing. You see... And truly what baptism shows is what's in your heart is real and it means more to you than anything this world has to offer the last thought I'd like to bring from what scriptural baptism is I'd like to bring forth the peace that comes upon somebody who is baptized look again in verse 39 and when they were come up out of the water the spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more now look here and he the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Before he met Philip, he wasn't rejoicing. He was kind of tore up, trying to figure out everything he was, he was missing in his life. But now he's believed on the Lord, and now he's submitted to scriptural baptism, and now after baptism, he's rejoicing. He has discovered a peace that he's never known. That void he had in his life has now been filled. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 3.21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now 
save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, my dear friends, when you get saved and scripturally baptized, you now have a good conscience toward God. What we didn't understand before we got saved is we were actually the enemies of God. I didn't know I was the enemy of God. I was just hoping to get to play baseball sometime. I was just living life. But when I got born again, got to study the scripture, I realized I was at enmity with God. In other words, I was the enemy of God. See, God loves sinners, but he hates sin. And while you're dead in your sins, you're at odds with God. But when you get saved, and when you take that first step of obedience to be baptized, you get a good conscience towards God. Now, now I'm not only no longer his enemy, now I'm one of his children. But also I'm in obedience to him, and I'm pleasing him, and I have a good conscience toward that. That's why folks who get born again, they might have, Brother Clayton, might have had trouble sleeping before he got saved, but after he gets saved, you can just put your head on your pillow and go to sleep at night. You don't have to worry about a thing because now you know who you believed in. Now you know the truth. It's amazing. <clears throat> Folks that have never experienced salvation don't understand that old John Newton song, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. It's amazing after you get saved, it's like it's a whole new world. It really is. I mean, it's like, I, the best way I can describe it, it's like, you know, the Wizard of Oz when they go from black and white to color. That's what it is. I mean, everything just comes into perspective. And uh, the sky looked bluer, the grass looked greener, the birds sounded sweeter. I mean, everything. Why? Because, really, I just started living. And the beauty of knowing Christ is I'll live for all of eternity. I've told you on many occasions, if one day you get up and you read the obituary and it says that Doug Foster died, don't believe it. No, I just changed wardrobes. I've just checked out from this life to go on to eternal life. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. Hmm? You know why the world's so upset about this pandemic? They don't know God. Can I help you with something? There's always been a pandemic. You know, there was the plague, the black plague. There's been smallpox. There's been polio. There's always something that can kill us. Uh, they've just politicized this one. But the truth of the matter is, as long as I'm in Christ and he's in me, it really don't matter. Whether I die of COVID or die of getting hit by a bus, it don't matter. That's all in the Lord's hands. I'll just choose to believe and trust in Him. God's been awful good to me. And I've said all that to say this. Do you know the Lord? There's nothing else really matters. Hmm? Say, well, preacher, I'll take my chances. Well, go ahead. By the way, you can get triple vac vaccinated and now fourth booster on its way and everything. I know somebody just heard today has been triple vaxxed and got COVID today. You can, you can get all the shots in the world. That's not going to protect you from death. The moment you took your first breath, death got on your trail. Your days are numbered. The only thing is you don't know the number. Only God does. Today could be your number. You can take your chances if you want. But you're going to give an account of yourself to God one of these days our prayer that you know him and the free pardon of sins if you're not saved you can be saved today in a moment we're going to have an invitation we're going to invite you to come if you come we'll get somebody to take a bible and show you how to be saved just like this eunuch uh, Philip showed him how to be saved you can be saved it's simple to be saved living a Christian life simple it's the best life you can ever live friend you can know Christ today Say, preacher, I'm saved. Have you been scripturally baptized? It's important. Well, preacher, I, I really hadn't thought about that. You ought to give it some thought. It's important. Say, well, preacher, I've been saved. I've been baptized. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Are you magnifying the Lord with your life so others can see they need the Lord? 
Let me ask you this. Are you in touch with the Lord just like Philip? That if the Lord came by your way and said, Hey, I need you to go down here and talk to somebody. Are you in a position where you could tell them what Philip told the eunuch? How to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because again, friend, that's why God left us here. That's why this church is here, to shine the light that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Say, preacher, is it really true? For 47 years I've known the Lord. It's been the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, he's been a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. I've had some hurts and some heartaches, had some storms, faced a lot of opposition in my life, but I've never faced it alone. And through it all, God's been good. And he's brought me through every trial, every snare, everything. He's a good God. I highly recommend him. When everybody else forsakes you, he just walks in and takes over. He's a good God. And he wants to be your God tonight. If you don't know him, oh, why don't you put your faith and trust in him tonight? The gospel's so simple, even a child can understand. My dear friend, don't turn him away. Be the best day of your life. If you're here tonight, you've been saved, but you've never been scripturally baptized, but you've been praying about it, well, why don't you get that thing settled? You sure don't want to meet the Lord with something unsettled in your life. Why don't you pray to that end, all right? Let's do this. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, if you'll get a song of invitation while they're picking out a song, I'm going to pray. If God spoke to your heart, why don't you come? Now, I know what the devil do. He'll put thoughts in your mind. What will this crowd think about me? I'm going to tell you something about this crowd. This crowd once stood where you stand. We all were lost at one point. This crowd put their faith in Christ. And this crowd helps keep the doors open so you can come hear the gospel. This crowd's not against you. This crowd's for you tonight. They care about you. They don't even know me, but they know God. And God cares about you. So they care about you. So if you're willing to come, give the Lord your life. He said, if you'll come to him, he no wise cast you out. And can I say this? So will this crowd. This crowd will embrace you with arms wide open. So while they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, thank you for these that have already come tonight. Lord, thank you for being a good God. Made a way for sinners to be saved from their sin. Now God, I pray there's somebody here tonight like this eunuch seeking seeking to be satisfied in their soul. But there's a void there. I pray they'd come. Let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. God, there may be some here that, Lord, have been saved, but, Lord, they're not where they should be. I pray they'd get back where they should be. There may be some who's been saved but never scripturally baptized. I pray, Lord, they'd consider that, that nothing be left undone for when Jesus comes. Now, Father, have your way in this invitation. Speak to hearts. God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.